Um, so I guess, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Do I need this? No. Yay. Excellent. Um, uh, today, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll introduce you to uh, high blood pressure and its uh, treatment. Um, I'm not sure. I sort of put together one of these slides. I, I don't know what to do with it, except to say that I'm not a morning person. <laughs> um, not at all. And I just got my coffee too, that's a shame. But uh, I will ask you um, to help me by uh, participating a little bit. Um, uh, in a little bit, uh, I'm gonna ask you some questions and uh, I'm just gonna ask everyone to raise their hand. Anyone had uh, uncontrolled hypertension and had a stroke so they can't raise their hand? Okay, good. Um, all right, so today's learning objectives. We're gonna define hypertension we're going to uh, describe at least two risk factors for having uncontrolled hypertension. Um, describe three ways to uh, measure blood pressure. We'll actually describe more, but I'm going to ask you to come away with at least three ways. Uh, come away with the uh, four classes of antihypertensive medications that are preferred uh, for treating patients with high blood pressure. And um, give you at least uh, five ways to uh, treat high blood pressure other than with medicines. And so, uh, since this is the beginning of the clinical series, I thought we should start off with uh, a patient. Uh, so this is Mr. Lee. Uh, he's actually from a, a photo stop company, but we're going to call him Mr. <laughs> Lee. He's 57 years old, and he's a truck driver who has high blood pressure, and he's overweight. His blood pressure, uh, when he was referred to you, uh, was 158 over 96, and his blood pressure is, I'm sorry, his BMI is uh, 28. His doctor had already prescribed him hydrochlorothiazide and amlodipine, but she doesn't think he takes it consistently. Um, and as you start talking to him, you know, you get some sense that he wants to lose weight, but really doesn't have the time. He has cut down on uh, smoking from two packs a day to two to three cigarettes a day, which, you know, is a win. And uh, for exercise, he likes to uh, watch baseball and lift the cans, uh, uh, isotonic uh, exercise. Uh, but this is only when he's not driving. So your first visit, he tells you, you know what? I'm not even sure why I'm here. I don't have hypertension. I only have high blood pressure. And I can feel it when it's up. So I don't even need to take my medicines except when I can feel it. That's OK, right? Have you heard this before? I don't know how much experience you've had with this yet. But you may, you may hear this. Uh, so OK, time to raise your hands. What should you tell Mr. Lee about hypertension? Uh, A, that hypertension and high blood pressure are the same thing that B, even without symptoms, his risk of having a stroke is uh, four times higher than if he had normal, high, uh, normal blood pressure. Uh, C, that you can give him some hope and say, you know, everyone can uh, get blood pressure control uh, and we can talk about that. Or D, since you guys uh, are uh, focusing heavily on this and I think it's important, nothing, because this is a motivational interview. You're gonna turn it right back to him and say, well, why do you think that? So who thinks A? Okay, we got A. Who thinks B? C? Uh, you can. You can keep raising your hand as many times as possible. Okay. Who thinks D? Motivational interviewing. All right. All right. So no non-hand raisers, a, a few, but all right. You, uh, you, you can raise for multiple. Um, uh, okay, so what is hypertension? Uh, hypertension is defined... Uh, in the physiology lab as the force of blood pressure, or uh, blood pressure is defined as the uh, force of uh, blood against the walls of the artery. And uh, high blood pressure is when that force is rel uh, high for a long period of time, and when it goes on for that long period of time, it's, uh, it's, just, it's the same thing as hypertension. Um, medically, we define this as a blood pressure of 140 over 90 or higher at two or more office visits. But really what matters is, is your blood pressure high uh, consistently throughout the day and night, uh, or is it uh, just a spike here and there? Um, you know, or, and uh, and then we're gonna get into ways that uh, you, you'll be able to figure that out. But let's just take for now that if your average blood pressure throughout the day and night is 140 over 90 or higher, um, that you have hypertension or high blood pressure. And a lot of times you're not going to have symptoms. Patients won't have symptoms, so, uh, you know, I, I get it. People will say, I have headaches, I can feel when my blood pressure is up. That's when your blood pressure is really, really up. 
But there are other times throughout the day where your blood pressure is not that high and you, like I'm probably doing right now, giving a talk, um, uh, and, and it can be also be high. Um, and the trick here is that if your blood pressure is high uh, consistently throughout the day, even if you're not feeling it, your risk of having a stroke is that much higher. So some scientific studies, um, but I won't belabor it, except this is different age groups, but in all age groups, uh, the higher your blood pressure is on average, the higher your risk of having a stroke, whether this is your systolic, the upper number of blood pressure, or diastolic. Um, and on average, for every 20 millimeters uh, higher than 115 <clears throat> that your average blood pressure is, your risk of stroke doubles. Same thing actually happens for uh, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, uh, for, for heart attacks. Um, uh, the higher your blood pressure is, the higher your risk, uh, in a linear way, is your, uh, is your risk for having a heart attack. Um, and uh, just to uh, uh, you know, drive the nail home, this is what it looks like when uh, we're in the hospitals, right? Like you come in, uh, you can't move, um, you got a CT, you, you see big blood, this is what it looks like if you don't quite make it. But you know what? This is what it looks like to patients and their families, right? Uh, you have a stroke. Um, you're not going to be able to move the muscles, lift the face. You might have memory problems. Uh, your arm might be weak on one side. Uh, difficulty walking. These, that's, a, that's a big problem. For uh, you know, it it's, it's, can be life limiting, and it's preventable uh, when treated early on. I have a question. Yes, please. With um, high blood pressure, what what type of stroke? Do you see that's most commonly associated with just hypertension? So you're asking about like bleeding strokes versus ischemic strokes. Yeah. Both types are uh, both types of uh, strokes are uh, um, increased risk with uh, with having uncontrolled blood pressure. Okay. Other things um, that are uh, you're at risk for with uncontrolled blood pressure: uh, heart disease, as we mentioned, congestive heart failure, where the fluid backs up on the lungs. Atrial fibrillation, um, which is um, related to the congestive heart failure, but it's uh, where the heart uh, uh, conduction issues are, are a problem. And this is the one where, you know, this is the most common uh, arrhythmia. Uh, so you may already know uh, people who are on lifetime of uh, blood thinner, warfarin, uh, for atrial fibrillation. Chronic kidney disease, far enough, you end up on dialysis with end-stage renal disease, blindness, dementia, and, you know, for a lot of people, this is important. Uh, erectile dysfunction uh, can also be an issue uh, it, without uh, un um, controlling blood pressure. Okay, so yeah, that's the scary part of the story. But here's the here's some good news. Um, over the past 15 years, we have improved hypertension control in the United States. Uh, 15 years ago, when um, when I was just coming out of school, uh, only about a third of people in the United States who had high blood pressure had control. And this, you know, with all the work that people have been doing. Uh, at this center and others, um, uh, you know, in the United States, we're up to about half the people who have high blood pressure are now controlled. Leaves a lot of work for the rest of us, but um, but this is good news in, in many ways. It, it's been a big effort. Uh, a little bit of bad news, though, is that among the people who are uncontrolled, you know, you are uh, less likely to achieve control if you're a man. You're less likely to achieve control if uh, if you're um, a person of color. Um, and uh, here's some other risk factors. If you have diabetes, you're less likely to achieve control. If you have chronic kidney disease, you're less likely to achieve control. You know, this is a lot of epidemiology, a lot of statistics. Here's what really comes down to on, on the front lines, though. Um, only two things matter when it comes to uh, not achieving high blood pressure, uh, uh, control of your or high blood pressure. Either a provider, uh, you know, may see a high number but says, you know, well, well let's just put it off. And then you don't end up getting a prescription to treat it or, or, or advice on how to treat it, or uh, patients aren't uh, taking the uh, treatments that uh, are known to be effective. Uh, there are plenty of treatments out there, but these are the two that really, when it boils down to, it's, it's either this, that, or both. Um, and so as uh, case managers, as, as care managers and, and community health workers, this is where you can come in, because if you recognize that somebody really could be treated, and, um, and, you know, have their treatment escalated, uh, but aren't, you can suggest this. Uh, if um, they aren't taking their treatment, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a good time to find out, you know, what's going on, and maybe there is a good reason for it, and maybe there's a good reason, but there's something, there's a third way that you can, uh, you can address that. So, 
Um, hand raising time again. Um, what should wh yeah? Wow, these didn't pop up. Uh, what should you tell Mr. Lee about uh, hypertension? Oh, I'm sorry. These are the answers. Uh, and so yes, uh, the answer is all of them. All of them are true. Um, high blood pressure, hypertension are the same thing. St increased stroke risk. Uh, it can get controlled, um, but you know. Perhaps now that you're meeting him, the best place to start is uh, is asking him, reflecting back, what what makes you think that, and, and learn a little bit more about him. Because um, in terms of uh, learning a little bit more about patients and and their providers, really, there are a lot of reasons why those two things that we uh, you know that that lead to um, blood pressure not getting controlled happen. Uh, from the provider side, you know, I, I'm guilty of every one of these things, right? You see a patient in clinic, and you're not sure. The patient says, you know, my blood pressure was low at home. I don't know why it's so high here in clinic, but it's probably, you know, and you're like, well, I could give you a medicine, but you could, you know, if I overtreat you, then you get dizzy and fall and break your hip. How's that any better? Um, so, so there's uncertainty about what the true blood pressure is. Uh, they're competing problems, right? Somebody comes in, their blood pressure's high, but you know they're depressed and want to kill themselves. They uh, they're wheezing and, and need oxygen. They're having a heart attack. Uh, I might I might put off treating their high blood pressure that particular day because um, I've got other things to take care of. Uh, but on the other hand, you know the next appointment might be in six months, and who knows what comes up then. Patients might tell me, you know, I don't want to get another medicine, and and I sort of do that dance with them and say, well. And you know, and we're okay. Let's put it off for a little bit, and, and let's come back to it. Um, patients uh, might not be taking it. You might say, okay, I'll take the prescription, but then not fill it. Uh, maybe it costs too much. Maybe they didn't like the side effects. Maybe they don't really want to think about having high blood pressure or those pictures of a stroke. Uh, the bleeding blood in the brain was too scary. Uh, sometimes it's just not right, right? You know, I, I'm busy driving my truck. I'm trying to get a business up. And you're asking me to think about this one more thing. I, I don't have time to think about it. Lots of reasons uh, not to either prescribe treatments or adhere to treatments. Um, and the trick here is to figure out, well, it's not one or the other. Sometimes there's a third way. Maybe you can um, take care of both of these things at the same time. Let's find out. Um, so you're starting to ask Mr. Lee some questions. And it turns out, he says, you know, I'm not even sure if I have high blood pressure anyway. Right? Here's, here, I've been keeping a log. Uh, you know, he keeps it right next to his uh, mileage log. And it's saying he went to see a uh, back surgeon for back pain, and the blood pressure was perfectly fine. He stopped off at a Safeway, and the blood pressure was up. Stopped off at a health fair in uh, Tacoma, and the uh, blood pressure was a little bit better, but this one was high, but that one was not. You know, uh, and then the last couple with his PCP were high, and that's why he ended up getting sent to you. So what's the story here? Is the blood pressure high? Is it low? Uh, who's right? You know, is, is maybe the blood pressure uh, shifts uh, from uh, um, up and down all the time. So, so here's a question for you. Now, okay, back to hand raising time. Unless you have questions. I thought I saw. Oh, well, I was just like, I, I think when you said the, the spine surgeon, uh -huh. it was manually taken. Uh -huh. Sometimes when you do it manually, people uh, guess it or estimate it. Mm -hmm. and, yes, indeed. And, um, and then with the PCP, and the, with that reading, I'm kind of like, well, they're doing their own monitor, you know, the, the machine monitor, so that's kind of just for the process. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's leads right into my question for you. What is the most reliable way to estimate a patient's true blood pressure? Is it A, a manual measurement made by a doctor? Oh, okay, okay. B, an automated measurement made by a medical assistant. Is it C, a home blood pressure monitor used by a patient? Or D, is it like my mother, you know, like checking my temperature, just putting her hands into the forehead saying, oh, you might have high blood pressure. Okay, who thinks A? Anybody? A? B? Should I go for the medical assistant? Uh, how about C, uh, measurements made by the, uh, the patient? D, anybody think that like his mother is better at assuming blood pressure than anybody else? Well, let's find out. Well, first of all, uh, you know, what patients and doctors tell us is absolutely true. Blood pressure goes up and down throughout the day. Uh, this is the best slide I could find on, on short notice, but I think it basically tells the story. So ignore all these shapes for now, because this is basically from a study that looked at like blood pressure 
over a 24 hour, they put a machine on a patient and measured blood pressure like every hour for 24 hours straight. Um, and they looked at people who uh, were on different kinds of diets and, and, and how much salt and so forth. But look at this, the, the, the curves are all the same though. Throughout the day, blood pressure is relatively high and then it dips at night and it comes back up. And even during the day, at uh, 8 in the morning, it's a little lower than 6 o'clock at night. You know what? So, so if you're going to get one measurement in the day, uh, this is probably the best time to get it. So first, you, know, you, you, want, you don't want to have high blood pressure, show up at clinic at 8 in the morning. <laughs> uh, if you, you want to have high blood pressure, show up at clinic at 6 o'clock right before they close and your blood pressure is more likely to go high. If you want to avoid entirely, go, the, you know, go somewhere and get a measurement at 2 in the morning when you're sleeping. Uh, I, I, I'm making that up, but because um, <laughs> uh, if you go to the emergency room at two in the morning, you're not going to get a blood pressure that low. Uh, but but so 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 this is what I was saying earlier that what matters is the average blood pressure. It's really not one single measurement. Um, it's it's taking all these measurements over the course of time and then averaging them out. And are you higher than 140 over 90, or are you lower than 140 over 90? Um, uh, but so, so when we get measurements in, in the course of a day, uh, we, we can run into issues. And then just like you mentioned, uh, when people get measurements in the office, the techniques that they use uh, can be a real problem because if you don't have the patient sitting, if you're not, the patient's not sitting quietly, their legs are crossed or their arm is up or down, all of these things can affect blood pressure. And on top of that, when you're deflating the cuff too quite fast with a manual measurement, um, you can in essence, estimate the blood pressure, make, it, make up the number as we're, we're going along, and you can get numbers that are way too high or way too low. Uh, so how can you, you know, if, if I were a patient, I might be a little bit skeptical, uh, and, and that would be understandable. Um, this is, uh, you know, you've probably gotten a lot of this from Joe and Erica, uh, but, you know, uh, so I'm just putting this up to remind you that when we're getting a measurement in the office, this is what it basically should look like. Patient sitting the comfortable, com quiet, Back supported, arm supported, legs uncrossed, and feet supported. Um, because when we don't do this, uh, this is uh, this is the result of a study of over four thousand patients. Oh, look at that! Um, and what they um, what they found in essence was that uh, if you get a single manual measurement in the clinic, uh, in a, and the higher number, the systolic number is between one hundred and twenty and one hundred and fifty-seven you really didn't have, you, you had less than 80% certainty that, of knowing whether the patient's blood pressure was truly high or not. Um, which basically means that, you know, a typical reading between those numbers can be misleading if you're only checking it once. Uh, so, and the implication there is get multiple measurements, but instead of asking the patient to come back three months later, six months later, three months later, and it's a year before you get enough measurements, We've got to find ways to get multiple measurements more quick, uh, um, uh, you know, faster. The, um, this is from the same study, and they basically asked, like, well, how many measurements do you need in order to be certain whether the patient is high, you know, has high blood pressure, or, you know, classify patients as having high blood pressure or low blood pressure? And um, instead of walking through the graph, I'll just give you the answer. Five measurements is a sweet spot. At least five measurements. You're getting your certainty is getting much better. Um, ten measurements. This is that higher line. Um, you get even more certainty, but five is pretty close. One, not that great. That's basically ab you know that's that's chance. Fifty fifty chance that you have high blood pressure or not. You get one measurement. Two is better, but not that great. Five, better, uh, and and close enough for uh, government work, as we like to say. And and, and ten even better. Okay. Um, so how do you do that? Well, here are a couple different ways. The, and, and I'm going to tell you something, I'm going to walk you through this because um, there are lots of different ways to measure blood pressure and we throw around this language all the time uh, and it's really easy to get confused, especially like automated office measurements and ABPM, which is kind of like a Holter monitor. Do um, you guys know what Holter monitors are? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me, let me walk you through. Uh, um, so these are, these are four different ways. Um, uh, but, uh, but you're still only getting one measurement. If you're doing confirmatory, you're, you're getting three measurements. Much, much better. Um, but you guys also are going to be in a position to refer patients for home blood pressure monitoring. And uh, actually, uh, in studies where they basically 
you know, have all these measurements, uh, and they averaged out all their measurements over time. Uh, and they looked to say, well, you know, there are some patients who averaged out over time had high blood pressure, and some patients who were averaged out over time had low blood pressure. Um, with each of these techniques, and sometimes you average out over time and had high blood pressure with this, te uh, with this technique, but not this technique, which of these is better? Which of these uh, predicts three years out whether you had a stroke or not? It turns out that this is the best, uh, and you get this from your slides also, but you know, this is the best at predicting whether you have a, you're going to have a stroke or a heart attack, next best, third best, uh, least beneficial. Okay, so if, if you're asking like, you know, well, you're not quite sure, if your patients are saying to you, uh, I'm not quite sure what, um, whether I truly have high blood pressure or not, uh, you don't want to push it off too much, but, if, but at the same time, I think it's, it's reasonable to give people a uh, benefit of the doubt and say, well, let's just find out. So this is, uh, this is uh, so, you know, in terms of, uh, we'll come back to this, but, um, but this is what, um, uh, this is slightly better than, uh, than the automated and definitely better than, than the, the, the um, manual measurements made in clinic. One caveat, though, is that there are different cutoffs. So 140 over 90 is what we're talking about in clinic measurements. But if you're sending someone home with a home blood pressure measurement and they're getting you know, twice a day measurements for five days in a row and they're bringing it back to you and you average out, you, you, you know, add up all the systolics and then divide by 10 and add up all the diastolics divide by 10, uh, 135 over 85 is the cutoff for a home blood pressure monitor. And then um, this is not something that you or I are going to get a lot of chances to use unless we're referring to a hypertension specialist. But a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitor, if you can see the picture, is basically like a little packet that you wear someplace or you sling it around. And then it's attached to a cuff that you have around your arm. And you walk around that with that all day long. You can even sleep with it. And we, we had a bunch of our interns uh, wearing this for like, yeah, a couple of weeks, actually. And as they're walking around, you know, they, you can do everything, right? You can, you can go in the OR, you can, you know, you can, uh, you can exercise, you can go jogging, well, all this stuff, wearing it. And basically once an hour, it will get a blood pressure measurement. And at the end of the day, you'll have uh, uh, 24 measurements. Um, sometimes they'll ever do it every 10 minutes, which I, I find disturbing. But, um, but, you know, they'll get bunches of bunches of measurements and they'll average them all out. This, and, and that's because, and remember how like throughout the day your blood pressure goes up and down and so forth? This can capture that, whereas this, these other three uh, can, and that's why it's, it's potentially the most, uh, most predictive of whether you have a stroke or not. But again, the cutoff is even lower um, um, for what's considered high. Uh, all right, so um, what's the most reliable way to uh, determine the patient's true blood pressure? Uh, the answer was uh, C, uh, home blood pressure monitor. Um, although, again, automated, for those who raised their hands for the automated, that's uh, far cry better than, than A. Um, coming back to Mr. Lee, um, having established that his blood pressure is controlled, he says, okay, all right, let's start thinking about um, getting it down, doc. But um, one thing that kind of irks him a little bit is his doctor, Dr. Bruce, um, she, uh, she wanted to add another medication. And he's like, look, I'm already on two. That's crazy to add three. Why does she keep pushing all these medicines on me? Two should be enough, shouldn't it? One should be enough. So what do you tell Mr. Lee? You say, A, actually uh, only one in four patients can get blood pressure control with uh, one pill. Uh, some people need two or three. Um, B, you can say, well, you know, you're an African-American man, so there are better choices for you than hydrochlorothiazide or amlodipine. Do you say C? Um, you know, a lot of patients, actually, they're taking six pills or more to get their blood pressure under control. Or do you say D, pills, schmills, try you know, relaxing to some reggae music. WTMD on Sunday nights. Um, <laughs> Who says, who says A? Uh, you know, one in four patients can have one blood pressure control. Who, who says B? Uh, that there are better choices uh, for blood pressure medicines than uh, thiazides and amlodipine. Who says C? Um, that a lot of patients will end up needing six pills or more. Who, who goes for D? Who, who's going to recommend reggae music? Joe will recommend reggae music to the patients. <laughs> 
Um, okay, so here, some, some good news. So, okay, I give you a lot of stuff on, uh, you know, blood pressure measurements, blah, blah, blah. You know, awful, awful, you know. Um, here's some good news. Okay, first of all, over 90% of your patients can achieve blood pressure control. They have that potential, which is huge, right? Like, we, only 50% are our control. So we, we can, we know that we can achieve, the, you know, at least 40% more. The bad news, to a certain extent, is this. A lot of patients do need more than one pill, okay? Uh, we know from the all hat side, this huge study looked at all kinds of different pills, uh, comparing different kinds of blood pressure medications, that A, for among the preferred medications, they're all basically the same. You know, a little bit more, a little bit less, you know, amylopine thiazides, uh, you know, calcium channel blockers are better for African Americans, but you know, it's sort of like uh, Android's a little bit better for some people and, and iPhone's a little bit better for other people. Uh, what we do know is that what the number is, is what matters in, in a lot of ways. You, you, have, uh, you have one pill, about a quarter of our patients will achieve control, but more importantly, at, with three of the medications, 90% of these folks Will, um, will achieve blood pressure control um, if they're taking it consistently, if they're prescribed it and they're taking it. Um, this is the algorithm used by the AHA, and the algorithm you guys got is very, very similar to this. Um, I'm mostly putting it up here to say uh, two things. Uh, first of all, that, uh, or you may basically reinforce uh, two things, because I think you may have heard this already. Uh, if a patient has high blood pressure, Start them off with a pill. More importantly, though, bring them back diuretic, quickly. Right? Uh, it can be, well, starting off with a diuretic, it seems like a reasonable thing. Mm -hmm. um, but if, we'll get, get into that in just a moment. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but certainly starting them off with a medication, diuretic is, is, is very reasonable. What's really important here, though, is getting them back. Because just because you, we know only 25% of people are going to get controlled on one pill, and that's at, at uh, treatment doses. A lot of times we start them on a half dose first to make sure they're not going to have side effects, right? So you got to get them back because chances are, you know, they're not going to be a control with that one pill. So you got to get them back to check their blood pressure and then you're going to, and, and set the expectation that, you know what, we may need to go up. And that's where this comes in. Is their blood pressure a goal? No. Then add something more or increase the dose. Is their blood pressure a goal? No. Okay. Add some more and increase some, you know, or, or increase the dose. Uh, and, and so forth. It's got to be stepwise, which basically means unless we want to wait, we know these patients are having strokes, with, you know, a, a large number are going to have strokes within three years. You don't want to have them come back every six months because if it takes six doses to get them up to, up to control, uh, that, that's going to be right around the same time that they're going to be showing up to the hospital, right? Um, so, so ideally, you're getting them back every, every two weeks. You know, they say three months in this uh, recommendation, but I think that's basically a... Um, uh, that's based on um, what we deem practical. But you guys are better than that. You guys can get them in faster. So, you know, um, but, but the important uh, thing here is getting them back in and adjusting as you go along. The second point is that um, if it's really high at the beginning, it might be reasonable to start them off with two medications. That's, this, uh, that's basically it for the algorithm. On the back, um, you know, I go, oh, sorry. And then, um, that there are four classes of preferred medications. Um, uh, on the back side of this algorithm, uh, it was what you were mentioning, which is thiazides are a really good medication for most patients. But in all honesty, uh, among the four classes, sorry, let me go back here. Among these four classes, they're all really good. So if there's somebody, um, thiazides are a medication that make you pee a lot. If there's somebody who's a truck driver, you know, thiazides are also really good for African Americans. If you're a truck, African American truck driving man, uh, which one are you going to go for? You know what? I would go for what work, what they're gonna, willing to take. Because again, what matters is did we prescribe something that is effective for treating high blood pressure, and does the patient take it? Um, but you're right. There, there are different, uh, different. Uh, there are preferential um, medications for, for certain classes. And, and I'm gonna run through uh, these uh, next couple slides real quick, but I wanted to make an analogy. And we're gonna see if this works, isn't it? I have a question. Yeah, please. Have you ever looked at or saw a study, um, I did just recently in my own studies, um, had to pull up some information about blood pressure 
and a piece of my assignment was to sort of look at cultural differences and then how to treat, how to best treat hypertension according to one's culture. And so I was doing some research, I looked and I saw something about um, some races um, have lower amounts of renin. And then how if you give someone renin, that could sort of help patients um, biologically to manage blood pressure in that way. Yeah, so, so there, are, there, are, there are many studies out there that have small samples, um, but in essence what they do is they look for a biologic. Um, and where these studies fit, at least from my perspective, where these studies fit in the whole grand scheme of things is somewhere along the way, um, uh, let's just say a drug company, right? But a drug company says, uh, you know, we need to figure out, we need to manufacture a molecule that will treat this condition. And they're looking, you know, they're, there's an infinite number of things that our bodies are just so complex. And so before, long before the drug company, there were, there were scientists, uh, people who work in, uh, at the bench, uh, you know, either with plates or with yeast or rats or, uh, or people, uh, graduate students a lot of times, um, uh, looking at Joe here, um, and, and they're looking for, uh, for targets for the biologic. And so this is a study, these are the kind of studies that I think about like uh, uh, looking for targets uh, for the biologic molecules. And so they look and say, okay, well, Renan does this, and then you make these arguments and stuff like that. And what happens then is if it seems reasonable and there are enough studies, the, the pharmaceutical company will develop a molecule, and they'll manufacture it, and they'll turn it into a pill. And then what they'll do is they'll put them in a whole bunch of randomized, uh, you know, get a whole bunch of patients, hundreds of patients, thousands of patients, and do randomized controlled studies. And half the patients will get this molecule and half of it uh, that was supposed to address this whole, you know, the renin issue or whatever, um, and half of them will get a sugar pill or they'll get a, a, a different pill and they'll see who does better. And, um, and you know, classic, uh, you know, an example that comes from my own life is that back in the day um, there, was a, there were people who said, you know what, congestive heart failure is a weakening of the heart muscle. And therefore, if you want to have people with congestive heart failure do better, you should avoid giving them a biologic that slows down their heart, beta blockers. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I was in school, I was taught, every, or right before I started my clinicals, that, um, that patients who um, have heart failure should not get beta blockers because they were making this reasoning that beta blockers slow down the heart and their heart muscles are already weak so their fluid would back up. Mm -hmm. But then they did these randomized control trials that came out right when I was starting my clinicals and half the patients got beta blockers and half didn't or what, you know. And what they found was actually this. Patients who got beta blockers live longer. Mm -hmm. The heart failure and uh, getting beta blockers live longer. So, so uh, this is all a long way of saying um, that uh, um, there are uh, studies out there that, you know, and they debate back and forth whether medications that um, um, affect renin levels uh, or affect the renin-angiotensin um, pathway, which are basically ACE inhibitors and ARBs, uh, angiotensin receptor blockers, um, uh, are more likely to be beneficial in certain uh, racial groups than others. Um, but in the end, what it comes down to, and this is, you know, this is actually feeds right nicely into the point I'd like to make, which is for our purposes, the purposes where we're working with patients and taking care of them. Um, if that is something that um, uh, a patient will say, I would be more likely to take that medicine, then I would go with that. But if on the other hand they're saying like, you know what, I hear you're saying it's better for African Americans, but I can't take this medicine because it's giving me this side effect, then I think it's much better to have um, a different medicine. And, and, and I was going to make this whole point about like if you're writing checks, right? Like you have all kinds of different pens and pencils, uh, all kinds of writing instruments. And sometimes you want to write a check. Uh, well, if you're going to write a check, it's better to use a black ink or at least blue ink, but using an ink, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't have something and you need to write a check, 
and you got a Sharpie marker, I'll tell you what, you write a check with a Sharpie marker and BGE will still cash that check. Okay, you might not want to use a pencil, but, but you know, so, this, so again, black ink, blue ink might be better, um, but if, you, if, you, if the only one that you can use at that particular time or only thing available or the patient's willing to take at that particular time is the Sharpie marker, then, uh, then, then go with that. Um, because, um, you know, I don't know that I can emphasize the point too much, so I'm going to keep doing it. Um, only thing that matters is either we prescribe, some, you know, we prescribe something that, that works for the patient and that the patient takes it. Sorry, that was... Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm going to run through these slides. Okay. Um, thiazides, do you guys know, how much medicines, about medicines do you know? Okay, uh, you know thiazides are water pills, mm -hmm. and they make you pee. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And I'm going to, you know, and, and here, this is, these are all going to be in your handout, so you can, and we can talk more. You know, these are the preferential groups, but I think if, You've probably heard anything from me. It's probably that, you know, these are the preferential groups. It's great to consider it, but in the end, what matters is that the patient is going to take it. Calcium channel blockers um, basically relax the uh, um, the um, artery walls and so reduce blood pressure. Um, <clears throat> you know, some common side effects. Patients, a lot of patients will come in saying their ankles are swollen. Um, uh, and if that's a huge problem for them, then maybe a different medication is better. But um, but if it's if it's you know sometimes his ankles are swollen, but they're willing to wear stockings, then okay, that's then if in order to keep their blood pressure controlled, that that's fine too. Um, one point I will make though is that when we're talking about calcium channel blockers, there are actually two types of calcium channel blockers. They're dihydropyridine, and they all end with the ipine. You know, philodipine, nifedipine, amlodipine, clobidipine. Um, uh, and then there are other types of calcium channel blockers that are not dihydropyridine, diltiazem and verapamil. Um, these do not, uh, these are not the preferred classes for uh, medications. So sometimes people, um, you know, somebody will have a spine surgeon, or not to crack on the spine surgeons, but, but you know, um, they'll, they'll, they'll say, hey, I have the patient on a calcium channel blocker. Yeah, it's not this. How about how about a different Are calcium? Are those channel? that um, the cardiazem class? Uh, is that used mostly on people um, who have heart failure? Yes. Oh well, it's used for patients. It's, it's these verapamil and diltiazem slow down the heart. Uh -huh. Um, so that's why one of the reasons they don't lower the blood pressure so much is their, their main focus is slowing down the heart. And so patients who have atrial fibrillation where the heart rate goes really fast, yeah. uh, many of them will be on diltiazem. But, uh, but it shouldn't be considered like one of the four top medications that we prefer for high blood pressure. Great uses for other things, uh, including slowing down the heart and when somebody has heart failure. Okay. Um, ACE inhibitors um, attack the renin angiotensin system and uh, you know, um, there are a lot of reasons to think it's good for uh, different preferential groups, <coughs> including diabetes, if you have chronic kidney disease, heart failure. Uh, in fact, you know, uh, you get a little uh, message from the hospital if you try to discharge a patient with uh, heart failure without one of these medications. Um, uh, but some common side effects that you do want to be aware of. Uh, cough <coughs> is really, really common. And if you have a cough, then and the next class of medications, the angiotensin receptor blockers, much better substitute. Okay, Everything that an ACE inhibitor can be, is good for, an ARB is fine for too. So, uh, so if you've got a cough, <coughs> ARB is a real easy substitute. That different kind. Of, cough sounds like that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing that you need to be aware of, though, um, is that these medications are teratogenic. They will cause uh, malformations if the fetus lives, uh, or a lot of times will just uh, will cause a spontaneous abortion. So, uh, women who are thinking about getting pregnant or uh, you know just got pregnant, they really should not be on this class of medications. Okay, and then finally, um, this class of medications, very rarely, but uh, enough that I've seen it, um, can cause swelling of the mouth, lips, can actually cause anaphylaxis and cause you to, you know, that's where like an EpiPen, go to the ER, never be on this medication again. If you, if this is a problem, then there's about a 30% crossover reactivity with ARBs. Uh, this class of medication is out for anybody who's... Then there are people who will. Right. But, but so, I still felt some kind of way about the medication because of what I saw it did to a person. Uh, how many people in here have kids? I want it. 
kids. But, um, how many people in here uh, send their kids to school? Okay. Um, anybody here wouldn't send their kid to school because every now and then somebody um, you know comes into school with a gun and does horrible things. If I had a kid, I wouldn't send my kid to that school. No, a school, any school, no. right? <laughs> Not that um, the, the, larger, the larger point I'm making is this, is that um, there are literally uh, hundreds of thousands, if, you know, hundreds of thousands, not millions, of people who uh, take these medications every day. Why do I do that? Because there are literally hundreds of thousands, actually there, there are you know, millions of people, 69 million people in the United States have, um, have high blood pressure. You know, how many more have diabetes, kidney disease, so forth. And if even a fraction of those people, we're talking millions of people are taking this medication every single day. Among those people, you know, in my lifetime uh, practicing, I've seen maybe three or four cases. If I were an ENT guy, I might see more, but we're talking, you know, one in 10,000 people have this reaction. And it's a reaction that if you catch it, you, you deal with it. Um, on the other hand, how many people have strokes? Okay. All right. You know, that, that picture of the, I, I was questioning whether to put the picture of the brain with a big blood ball in it, you know. Um, but that happens all the time. It happens much, much more than, than angioedema. And so, you know, maybe the school thing was a little, a little um, uh, right. cavalier with the school thing. But, yeah, drastic. Um, uh, with, with school shootings, but but the larger point is this: we have to go through life and and do things. And if you and so it it is important to weigh uh, risk and benefits. And in terms of the risk, I'm bringing these up because these are important for you to recognize. These are the top three things for you to recognize. Um, but but on the but that's because you are on the line now, right? Patients are going to be coming to you, and you're going to be able to say to them, you know what? If you're having these symptoms, you probably shouldn't be on this medication. Let's go. You know, you're going to be doing medication reconciliations. This is going to be part of you know your your job now is is figuring out whether somebody coming in with lips swollen or having trouble breathing, wheezing, uh, is due to any one of these medications. And and now you are better equipped to to recognize that lisinopril would be an issue. But that does not mean that you know the other you know. Uh, 900,000 people shouldn't be on, 999,000 people shouldn't uh, be on it. It's just, we're, we're, that we're a part of the line and we're, we're you know, trying to catch the few that, that have a problem. Mm -hmm. What I have seen <clears throat> being a nurse from the hospital is that patients have been on lisinopril for years, bam, here we are with the allergic reaction. Usually angioedema. And they're like, well, I don't understand. I've been on them for years, but what patients don't understand is um, a reaction don't necessarily have to happen when you first start to take it. It can happen anywhere throughout the period that you are taking the medication. That's right. I have another question to add to that. Um, from a research perspective, is there any information or literature that would, you know, like show a provider? Like what um, types of questions to ask that would sort of make the provider think that the patient is allergic to this class of medication? Are there any like lab tests, um, genetic biomarkers that would suggest that somebody would have an allergic reaction to this class of medication? Um, not not anything that's practical. The the best thing that you can do, um, and it's come up, I know it's come up earlier in uh, this week for you, but the best thing that you can do is to interact with your patients regularly and to talk to them and get to know them as people and to, you know, have day in, day out conversations. This is the information that allows you to, when they happen to offhand mention, half the, you know, over half the time that I, I make a big diagnosis is because someone just says, you know, doc, I happen to like you, we're talking baseball or whatever, and then they basically say, and by the way, my lips have been swollen. And you're like, what? Because you're already thinking, you know, you have this, this in your armamentarium now. Um, but, uh, so it's not so much like a blood test. The, the, the blood test, the magical thing that comes out of boxes, you like talking with them regularly.
Um, the uh, final class of the top four medications is the angiotensin receptor blocker. Uh, the uh, generic names will all end in Artan, Candesartan, Olmosartan, Losartan. Um, very similar to the uh, ACE inhibitors uh, in, in many ways. You know, they're good for all the same classes. Um, they work in basically the same um, part of the system, the renin angiotensin system. Um, and the um, allergic reaction is, uh, is also uh, an issue. The one difference is that whereas cough is really common with ACE inhibitors, um, you can substitute uh, this medication for ACE inhibitors if someone's having a cough and they're cough, they shouldn't have the cough. Okay. Uh, I'm going to throw out two other medications. These are the four. Remember what I said, like, you know, three classes of medication, 90% of patients can get controlled. Um, these, are, these are the top four right here. Uh, but every now and then, there are going to be people who need some second-line medications. If nothing else, you know, people have some sort of side effects or whatever. So I'm going to throw out the next two that, uh, that are in the preferred categories, which are beta blockers. These medications slow down the heart. Uh, they all end in the OLAW. Um, they, some of them are once a day, some of them are twice a day, which, you know, can help with adherence. Um, um, some common side effects that you may recognize uh, run into, though if someone is on these medications and someone's complaining, um, feeling tired all the time or worsening depression, which can often look the same as feeling tired all the time. Mm -hmm. or, or if someone's complaining about those things in, and there's another thing that could be substituted, like, go, you know, hey, you're not an ACE inhibitor. Um, uh, this might be something to suggest to the PCP is, hey, the patient's feeling tired all the time. Could it be the beta blocker? Uh, and then finally, rarely are you going to see this, but this is, this is inside baseball. This is what hypertension experts find they're not used enough for the potassium sparing diuretics, uh, spironolactone. Um, you know, just uh, be careful about, you know, doctors should be careful about using them with kidney disease and, and high levels. So coming back to our question earlier, what do you tell um, Mr. Lee that uh, very few patients are controlled with just one medicine? Sometimes you um, need two or three. Um, but on the other hand, you're not going to need six either. Okay. You just need to be taking them. So it says, okay, okay. By the way, we're, how are we doing on time? Just like this. Um, are, well, there's a break at 10, and it's 9.55. I'm going to flush through this real quick. Yeah. Um, because this is, this is, I think, is where your, I saved, I saved your, uh, your, the money tools uh, for you. Um, although I'm going to ask you this. What's the most effective? Of all these things, what's the most effective for lowering blood pressure? Who says cutting sodium? Who says cut out the salt? Who says losing 10, 20 pounds? Who says cutting alcohol? Cut out the booze. How about the DASH diet? You guys have heard about the DASH diet, right? Well, no, no, I'm just asking about the most. Bob Marley tunes. <laughs> the most, the most. You got, you, got, you got your money down? Put, put your chips down on, on what you think is the most important? All right. So, okay, here's, uh, here's um, uh, something that comes I don't know why I cited my favorite. I should have cited the, uh, the guidelines. But this, kind of, this, is the, this, is, this has been studied very much and uh, published um, by consensus committees from uh, the American Heart Association and the American Cardio uh, College of Cardiology. Um, look at this. Okay. Lose, if you're overweight, losing 10 kilograms, which is about 20 pounds, uh, can lower your blood pressure as much as 20 millimeters. DASH diet plus a low-sodium diet, 10 to 14 millimeters. Compare it. Oh, look, I've got a pointer. Compare it <laughs> to uh, how much effect you get from one medicine. Okay? So we know that, uh, you know, about a quarter of patients can be controlled with one medicine. 90% um, uh, can be controlled with three, right? Look at this, though. If you're losing weight and you take a DASH diet, instead of, if you needed two, maybe you only need one. If you needed three, maybe you only need two if you can do these other two things. So in your armamentarium is something that, uh, that you can share with uh, patients is, hey, you know, we oftentimes will, and, and it is important, right? Oops, sorry. Uh, it is important to, uh, to like, look at food labels and count the amount of sodium and stuff like that. 
but, uh, but you know, get that done fast because you really want them to start thinking about this and that. And so with that, I'm going to close out with uh, two topic areas. The first is, what does it mean to exercise? Because we're talking about losing weight and we're talking about the DASH diet. So how do you lose weight? Well, you exercise more, you eat better. Uh, this is what they say for exercise, okay? Three to four minutes, 30 minutes a day, most days of the week. That's what's in the guidelines. What does that mean? I have no idea either, so I had to look it up. I looked up, some of this comes from Wikipedia, so take it for what it's worth. All right, I think it's right. So, so the guidelines will say walking briskly. I'm still not sure what that means, but walking to work, right? Walking, or taking the stairs, that's walking briskly too, because going upstairs or hill work is just uh, speed work in disguise. Uh, parking far from the store and walking in. Bicycling, and walking back really. Bicycling, canoeing. Uh, so I'm not even saying playing basketball. I'm not saying play a pickup game of basketball, which is a lot of meds. I'm saying, you know, meet the kid and play horse. Go around, you know, H, O, you know, that level. Have you seen, have you watched TV and, and seen those guys on the golf course? Okay, those guys are doing three or four meds, okay? Uh, or probably a little bit more than that. But like, you know, walking on the golf course as fast as those old white guys on TV. <laughs> Um, is, is, is basically exercise. Sexual activity, actually I lied about this, this is not three to four minutes, this is six, so you can, you know, half the time, okay? 30 minutes a day, four days a week. Surely somewhere along here are things that people are willing to do on a regular basis. Just saying. So for sexual activity, one, you would have to last for 30 minutes. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Yes. yes. It's multiple times a week. <laughs> yeah, but, but keep in mind, okay, the asterisk, it does not need to be all, all at, at one, one time. time. So you're saying three times. Yes. I am. And you can combine them, right? Play horse and then <laughs> walk to work, come home, play horse with the kids, and you know, I'm just saying. This is this is physical activity. I, I want them to be creative. <laughs> just help them. So the DASH diet, okay. Uh, how much have you gotten about the DASH diet already? We haven't reviewed it, but we have information on it. Okay, um, here, here's the bottom line about the DASH diet. The DASH diet is basically, it, it, it's, you know, it's, it's like playing tag. You can do it any way you want, as long as it's fruits, vegetables, you know, look at this, it's meat, it's just lean meat, okay? It's fish, it's poultry, chicken, turkey, right? Just not preserved turkey, right? Low sodium. What? Steak? Depends on the, it may depend on the custody, and it also depends on how much, okay? A little bit of meat, sure, lamb, you know, a little, a little bit of all this stuff, but it's a lot less of that and a lot more of the fruits, vegetables, um, nuts and beans. So you can get lots of protein, you know, I, oh, people are always talk, telling me like, oh, I need more protein in my diet because I work out and stuff. But first of all, we just talked about physical activity. But putting that aside, you know, you can have plenty of protein. It's just that it's got to be balanced more towards fruits and vegetables and cutting out the sugary stuff. And okay. I see red meat. No, limited, I should have I put that, limited in sugar sweetened foods, limited in those beverages, and limited in red meats or... I had a steak last night. Could you not have a good pizza steak and a good burger? Well, so what does that look like? So people are always, yeah, okay. Because you're doing motivational interviewing, right? And people are going to be like, look, i got to have a steak. That's fine. We'll talk about like, what's the size of the steak and how much of it in the course of your meal, right? And what else are you, where else are you getting your calories in the course of the day? So, you know, a filet, so if you're going to go, you know, this is an excuse to go quality, right? You need a little, like, you know, four ounce filet mignons, right? And a big old side salad. Yeah, that's, that's a dash diet. In fact, let me show you some, okay? So this is not a DASH diet. This comes from Brent Egan um, in South Carolina, and he got some families. He's been working with some families. Uh, this is how, so people are always like, oh, I can't be on these hypertension or cardiovascular diets because they're too expensive. I'm like, let's, you know, so he, he was like, well, let's look at what is in your home, right? $342 for a week's worth of this, which is definitely not the DASH diet. Uh -huh. And if you go the other stream, right, um, uh, by the way, you can buy this. 
But uh, you can go the other extreme. Look, these folks are living on $1.23 a week, okay? And this is definitely the DASH diet. But of course you're saying to yourself, well, you know, or you're, certainly your patient is going to say, I need a good piece of burger and, you know, I need, I need a steak and, and, and some food. So, so look, these are all DASH diets. Okay, this is all from the DASH diet cookbook. It doesn't have to taste bad. I'm going to share this with you. I want this back, though. Um, uh, this is the Dash Diet for Southern Style cookbook. Flip through it while you're looking at it. Uh, I'm going to show you in just a moment where to get it. I want that back, though, because it cost me $5 to print it at Kinko's. I know, it's so expensive, right? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to show you where it is on the website. So this is the Dash Diet. Look at this, look at this. All right, so, what? Uh, it could be portobello's. This is, is actually eggplant, but it, it could be portobello's, right? Because this is just pizza. A little bit of tomato sauce, a little bit of cheese. You, you see, you can have cheese, just a little bit, of, on top of a vegetable instead of crust. Yeah, it could be. Portobello would be a great way to like fix that up, right? Look at this. You got you got you got your salmon steaks, your fish cakes. You got some chicken, but even here, look, there's beef there. You got if you really gotta have your cow. It's just that it's, it's a little bit of cow with a lot of taste for, and, and a lot of uh, you know, tomatoes and cucumbers and, and, and so forth. Is that rice for, the, for like the filling part of that? Uh, no, it's actually, it's actually a Greek style uh, tzatziki. Kind of, so, so it's basically a little bit of olive oil, a little bit of, a lot of you know, lemon juice, a little bit of salt, but tomato, cucumber, dill. So what do you need in order to do a DASH diet? Well, first of all, you need cheap food. Well, there's, there's plenty of cheap food to be had if you can't, you know, if you're living on a budget. This is an example in Baltimore. This is not necessarily going to be a case outside the city, but, but there are other way, you know, other programs outside the city. I'm just saying this because I have personally carried one of these blue bags, actually carried two of them. It's super heavy. And my time's up, but I've only got three more slides. Um, <laughs> uh, what you also need to know is learn how to cook. This is a, a resource that's available in Baltimore that you can send patients to. Uh, this is Tia Berry. Do you know Heart Kitchen? Yes. I do. I don't see it. Okay. I do. She's at the college down in Central Avenue. But um, that is, uh, well, I haven't seen any classes scheduled lately, but you see the classes for like $5. And sometimes we had a free set of patients, but they're like $5. And she actually demonstrates a live um, cooking, how, a healthy presentation right in front of you and they provide all of the food for you and you actually can take um, enough food home to feed four family members of which oh. so yeah. yeah yeah so you learn how to make something you go home with a meal it's five dollars mm -hmm. and honestly you know I've I've I've, I've met someone on a date who came in from like Columbia, Maryland. Like they drove in, and it, you know, it's it's right next to Felt Point. You go out for a beer afterwards. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Uh, and then this is the cookbook, and the website's right there. Okay, which is also in your hand now. Um, okay, so you know, losing twenty, uh, losing uh, weight was the most effective. But um, so here's the summary and. Um, thank you.